you acknowledge, you'll just get some acknowledgement that the session is actually being um, recorded. So afternoon, everybody. I think we've got a couple uh, more people who are um, due to join the session. Um, I just want to point out a couple of people who are on from PMO Learning. Firstly, um, uh, Hannah, um, who's there, who's the yeah. course administrator. So anybody who's interested in um, joining the course, she'll be the person who gets in touch, provides you with materials and looks after you carefully. And we've also got Charles Shoron, who's our sales lead. Hi. Um, so um, if you want an extra discount, he's the guy to... Um, to, to, to phone up and <laughs> uh, he's going to love me for saying that but he's the guy to phone up and have a have a private word to see if you can get a little bit more um off the course so welcome to our taster session today about unlocking business agility through portfolio management um a two-day course that gets not gets uh, normally gets delivered by me and um, gets delivered by one of our trainers but I'm just going to take you through the taster session today. So who am I? My name is Eileen Roden. I'm one of the uh, co-founders at PMO Learning but also work alongside uh, Lindsay Scott at House of PMO. Um, I did, um, uh, as I say, this is really important for us is that I did have 17 years actually doing what I always call a proper job where I worked in a project environment uh, and managed managed multiple PMOs in different organizations. However, for the last 16 years, I've come over um, to the other side. Uh, I can never decide whether it's poacher turned gamekeeper or gamekeeper turned poacher, uh, but I now do training and consultancy where I do um, several um, training uh, position, uh, training, training, assignments where I deliver training courses, but a lot of the time I'm working with organizations to help them improve project delivery capability in their organization and typically working alongside um, PMOs. Uh, you may uh, know me as lead author of the competency framework, but also of P3 or best management practice, as well as some other stuff. Now, the, the gentleman who uh, would normally uh, deliver or who does normally kind of deliver these courses is a, courses is a guy called Holger Hus. He's been um, a, an associate of ours now for a couple of years. And I think just an, an important thing to kind of recognize is that um, Holger has a day job. So he's one of the senior managers at KPMG working in the enterprise agility practice. So even though, you know, kind of us at PMO Learning have got experience around uh, lots of different PMOs and lots of different elements of PMOs, where we want some kind of specialist advice and guidance, we do look um, out to the wider world to kind of to identify those associates who can talk with some um, credibility, some gravitas, some real experience to back up uh, what they're talking about. So Holger, you may be joining us on the course. He said he would try uh, to get along, but Holger is, is the guy who's built the model that the course is uh, based on uh, and who will do delivery. So just a, a little bit about PMO Learning, if you don't know um, about us, we are a um, specialist PMO training organisation. Um, I've worked for several project management training organisations before, uh, and myself and Lindsay were kind of just a bit... It was quite difficult to actually find a training course that was aimed specifically at people who were working in PMO. Uh, very often we ended up going to a project management training course and then try and extract the bits that were helpful for us from a PMO um, perspective. So our organisation was set up specifically um, to do that. Uh, we deliberately make all of our courses interactive because what we want to do is, yes, we're, you know, we're, we're conscious on those certification courses, people want to pass their exams, but actually... Um, what's really important is the ability to take away some practical application um, for the workplace. Um, and so all of our training, is, uh, and as I mentioned, kind of Holger does have his day job. All of our trainers have experience of working or managing a PMO. We don't um, have anybody who's just kind of learned the material and thinks they can kind of relate to a bunch of delegates. So the idea is, is that uh, when you're sitting there working with a trainer from PMO Learning, they can come up with lots of different um, examples of organisations where it actually happens. And again, one of the comments from one of our feedbacks was said it was really nice to hear the trainer say, well, actually, I was doing just that last week in my J job. So there's some real kind of credibility there um, amongst our trainers. 
So Holger has arrived. Morning, Holger, or afternoon. Morning. You've missed the lovely introduction I gave. I'm not doing it again for you. Um, so um, Holger's there, so yeah, I'm sure he'll kind of correct me and add to the conversation um, as we go. So the idea of, to, uh, is to, of today's session is really to give um, you guys a better understanding of the content of the um the course and just to give you an idea in terms of how it's delivered in a virtual environment and we were one of the first organizations who made a choice back down um, in 2020 to go with uh, absolutely go virtual completely and um, we developed uh, the materials and the technology that we needed to use to be able to run those as a true virtual classroom and just for those of you who've not um, been in a virtual classroom before I think one of the interesting things to recognize um, is the difference between kind of what we would normally class as a kind of a webinar uh, and virtual training. So in a webinar is very much akin to a lecture where typically people have their cameras off and um, they kind of just listen in and I often uh, see people and I'm, I'm guilty of this myself when I'm listening to a webinar I almost kind of treat it as a podcast so I might be busy around in the kitchen or kind of pottering and doing some other stuff and it's kind of on in the background however when it comes to doing a virtual classroom we really do want to set it up as a as a, as a classroom workshop. So we will um, we always let people uh, mute and unmute themselves. Uh, we let them kind of join in the conversation um, as required. We will use uh, bits of technology to allow them to kind of go off into breakout rooms. And exactly as you would in a in a classroom workshop, you'd be writing on flip charts and having conversations between small groups of people um, in the course. It wouldn't all be the the trainer just standing at the front of the course. Well, not a good trainer company it's not all of the trainer just kind of standing um at the front of the course and so um we we do kind of have a couple of ground rules that we just kind of think helps uh, with that so we do ask delegates to put uh, their cameras on um in the same way as that if you were sitting in a classroom we would be able to kind of see each other and it isn't just about the trainer being able to see you uh, as a bunch of delegates it's also about you being able to see the other delegates because that kind of visual contact helps build some of our relationships and understanding of the other people who are sitting around the course and we do um, recognize that some people have an issue with bandwidth but uh, but on the whole um, we have the vast majority of people who have their cameras on we are also conscious that we're all sitting at our PCs and good old invention of windows means that we have several windows open and potentially lots of distractions. We do um, have good uh, breaks, both uh, coffee breaks, mid-morning, mid-afternoon and lunchtime. So it does give you a chance to catch up on of your or emails. So we do ask people to kind of switch off all of the, the notifications when they're attending one of the course. We do limit the number of delegates we have on any course to 12 um, for two reasons. One is certainly from a trainer's perspective, it's really important to be able to have a relationship with the people who are there from a delegate perspective, just to make sure that we're addressing people's needs, that we are clear that people, all of the delegates understand what's happening as we go through the, the, the training sessions. And so from a, an exercise perspective and a discussion perspective, you know, that can be a very lonely place if there's no conversation or if only one or two of the delegates get involved in those discussions. Uh, one of the things we always say is that as a trainer, you know, we learn as much as the delegates at the attendance of any course because we find out about what's happening in different organisations. We get a different perspective that perhaps we'd never um we'd never considered. Uh, people ask us questions that we don't know the answers to, which is always an interesting one. So if any trainer says, I'm just going to come, I'll be picking up that point after coffee break. What that means is we're going away at coffee break and trying to find out kind of uh, an answer to that some of the time. So, um, but but that's really good. And, and sometimes we can say, well, actually, you know, Gina, you've got that question. Actually, Nicole, based on the kind of the conversations, perhaps you've got an answer that might help Gina. So we use the delegates as well as part of the whole kind of learning learning process and particularly a, a course like this which is at manager director level you know the people on the course are likely to have experience that is really useful for us all to learn from and um, not just the trainer we are very conscious um, that um, the 
we, we are kind of online and there are kind of challenges with kind of technology. So one of the reasons why we always kind of use the chat and we have the chat box open. And again, we use reactions and we do encourage people to kind of do the whole kind of physical uh, uh, what uh, humicons I think is what they're what they're called sometimes is just to try to give an indication but but typically we kind of just conscious to be a uh, tech away but also to be considerate of the other delegates that are on the course so absolutely kind of listen to to the other delegates and you know kind of when we come back from coffee make sure we're on time but I think the other thing that's kind of not specifically listed in there certainly when we're in the breakout rooms is just if there's kind of three or four of you in that breakout room and somebody's not contributing just to kind of make sure that you kind of bring them into the conversation uh, whether they're kind of feeling a bit lost or whether they just can't get a word in edgeways and we do kind of encourage the the breakout rooms to to get everybody involved in those conversations uh, from a technology perspective the public courses um, by default will use zoom so very similar today we'll use video and audio and a powerpoint presentation uh, to support that and um, we use the chat we use breakout rooms to kind of have the smaller conversations and we potentially were going to use some polls as we go through the session we do use um, other technology as well we use mentimeter so um, Sometimes we use it when we're doing exam questions because it's quite nice to be able to get the um, exam questions up there and people to kind of answer online. Um, but there are lots of ways that we can kind of use Mentimeter. My role for those who haven't used it is a, a everlasting whiteboard that allows us to kind of have various whiteboards and post-it notes that we can use. And then Trello is um, a, typically a Kanban board, but it means that we can use kind of lists and kind of predetermined lists to kind of to move things around. Now, the important thing um, to, to recognize is that even though we use all of this technology from a delegate, there is no requirement for you to shell out any additional funding. All you need to do is, is um, particularly in Trello, you need to create an account so you can get access to some of the things that we use. So a, a range of technologies and, and quite a few of the delegates have said, you know, one of the uh, benefits of coming on the course is they've actually learned a bit more about technology um, as they've kind of gone through the session. So um, I have to say, when we started doing virtual training uh, two years ago, um, it was quite a learning curve for both the trainers and the delegates to get to grips with that. But most, uh, well, all of our trainers are certainly now up to speed, but most of the delegates um, have um, kind of been involved in some kind of virtual activity over the last couple of years and therefore um, the, the technical support that Hannah provides first thing in the morning on the first day um, has, has considerably reduced to kind of where it was. And throughout the course, not just and the first day. The course, yes. So, um, so that uh, that is there. But we do kind of take you through that before you join the course. Um, you will get some kind of detailed instructions just to make sure you can kind of test your ability to join the course before we get there. So. That's just kind of how we run it. So obviously, the kind of the, the the real bit we're all here for is the course structure and um, course content. So I'm just going to give a kind of quick overview of the course, and then I'm just going to delve into one particular um, section of the course. Um, and, and Holger may uh, add some of his wisdom around that. Um, feel free to to join in, Holger. Um, you're in charge of your own mute button, as you know. So. In terms of the, the course, it's really based on, as we um, said when we uh, introduced who Holger was, Holger has developed uh, this kind of portfolio capability model, which is based on eight indicators that kind of demonstrate how, or looking at all of these eight indicators would indicate how mature organizations are at enterprise portfolio management so that doesn't just lead itself to kind of waterfall or agile projects it's the whole piece um, from a from an organization perspective and as we said uh, in terms of the kind of the overall kind of job title this is about um, organizations who want to be agile with a small a uh, flexible whatever however we want to kind of translate that who need to be dynamic in terms of responding to the organization's environment uh, that it uh, delivers in need to be able to uh, be effective and capable in this enterprise portfolio management. So there is eight um, 
indicators that uh, are addressed. And it's important to, to realize that actually there's some work done before the course. So prior to the course, you will get sent a link to complete a questionnaire that gives you um, a, a number of questions to answer and some um, responses that you give. That then gets analyzed by Holger prior to the course and you will receive some individual feedback based on your responses. Now, we are quite conscious that um, when you're coming on the course, you may not necessarily want to share your organization's dirty linen in public. And so your particular um, questionnaire and your feedback is only to you. That's not shared with the other delegates on the course. The only time um, we might do that, uh, and Holger's done this uh, for a couple of organizations now, is where we run the course as an in-house course. And then what we get is a consolidated view of those questionnaires to give a kind of a broader view of that organization and again depending on the um depending on the, uh, the the organization in terms of how many people have filled it in certainly the last time we did this we actually uh, sent the questionnaire out to more than just the attendees so we got an even better picture of the maturity of the organization and then the delegates on the course uh, looked through this um, as they went through the course and the idea is and again going back to the very kind of practical nature of what we're trying trying to deliver. As we go through the course, it means that de delegates can identify specific actions that they want to take and address in their organisations. So it just helps that whole kind of learning right from the beginning of the course to say, well, actually, based on, um, you know, kind of Holger's assessment and organ um, observations, then actually I can see now how some of this particular theory or some of this model might actually be useful for me. So in terms of kind of coming into the course, we've got um, six uh, themes that provide the backbone to the course and kind of link back to those kind of eight key indicators. So uh, the course will take time going through each of these uh, six different sections. Uh, and interestingly, we'll talk about what the impact is on the kind of portfolio management and why it's important. But actually, then there's also some theory, um, obviously, to kind of get that uh, information in terms of how we're going to uh, use some of those theories to improve uh, portfolio management in our organisation. So I'm just going to kind of rattle through the, the six different um, sections just to tell you what's in there. And then I'm going to hone in on one particular section um, in today's session. So first thing we, um, we cover off is um, strategy and leadership. So we'll talk about kind of what uh, is portfolio management, what it's involved. Um, we'll talk about kind of the importance of strategic alignment, the investment mix that we have, and again, how that differs from organization and some guidelines in terms of what that might be. And we'll talk about some target setting to make sure that we're achieving what the organization needs to achieve. The second section um, that we go on to is we talk about corporate culture. So we'll have a kind of a quick uh, definition of what corporate culture is. And then we kind of delve into a couple of areas that have a real kind of drive uh, and impact on corporate culture. So first thing uh, we'll talk about is standardization and conformity um, and where that sits and how, how our organizations conform. We're all kind of wild mavericks in our organization and the impact that may have. We talk about uh, communication, what are the roots of communication, um, is anything communicated at all, um, and what the, that sits like in our organisation. And again, we'll go back to some kind of individual targets that need to be um, addressed. And one particular subject that I know is uh, of great interest to me is we talk about the governor governance arrangement. So how do we set up governance in our organization and how does that have an impact on uh, the portfolio management element that we're going to look at? So we talk about the definition of the governance arrangements. We talk a bit about decision making and we talk about um, the approach and the view of delegation in our organizations. Um, and again, you know, 
you'll see that um, all of these different sections, even though we kind of cover them off one at a time, is not necessarily completely siloed because obviously kind of the, the delegation and decision making, a lot of it is driven by um, or will drive the culture in the organisation. So they're definitely kind of interplays between the, the, the six different sections. Uh, the fourth section is uh, reporting, um, and I always find that whenever we've done any research on PMOs and what PMOs do, uh, it's the one thing that every PMO does, uh, if, even if they do nothing else. So very much kind of um, reporting becomes uh, an important part of um, what's involved at a, at a portfolio level. So we'll do a reporting into uh, introduction, talk about the management of reporting, and again, um, the the culture of the organization and, and that uh, how that influences the reporting uh, and vice versa and then there's some kind of quite interesting kind of conclusions we can build around those uh, those reporting arrangements the fifth section um is we um start talking about the supporting functions um, and what that is and you know obviously we've said that this course is specifically designed for people who work in and around PMOs um, and so we just look at kind of the role of the central PMO the interactions uh, with um, other um, support uh, functions uh, and what their role is in portfolio management and how they contribute and then there's some kind of conclusions that we can draw based on the conversations that we've had and then the final section is processes and tooling. Now, some of you might have done um, MOP, um, Management of Portfolios, and this is where you know there is a we recognise there are some processes that take place. Obviously, this model kind of looks wider than just what's covered off um, over an MOP, but we do talk about kind of some of the process framework and the portfolio management framework um, in here. Um, and interesting that kind of penultimate, another third from the end, in terms of kind of of the, the planning and the planning processes uh, that are involved in getting um, effective portfolio management that allows, you know, kind of drives this agility. And then the final section uh, we talk about is tooling. And I'm just going to do a shout out to Nicole. If she's going to quick wave, um, Nicole um, is a really useful person to know because she specializes and has a very um, objective view of the various kind of tools that are out there and what's used for what uh, across different organizations so uh, that section covers off the tooling so within those kind of six different themes we will kind of use our assessment of the eight different indicators to kind of demonstrate and uh, what some of the theories, what some of the practices that need to be in place in our organizations. And hopefully you can see from the, um, the breadth of all of the kind of information that's covered, it can kind of go off into kind of different areas. Now, the beauty of having a non-certification course is that although we've got kind of all of the slides and we will go through all of the, the content, it does allow Holger to go off and focus on particular areas. So um, I use those words advisedly, um, but, but Holger has a view of the delegates before they come on the course, because he's seen the questionnaires, knows perhaps what some of those key areas are. And certainly um, he's not been unknown to add in an additional session at the end of the kind of the first year or the second day, because there's been a kind of particular request. So we do cover all of the material in the standard hours, but he'll say, I'm going to do an extra half an hour tonight because somebody has a kind of particular issue around some of perhaps some of the portfolio management processes. So again, that is um, what, and certainly um, as, as Holger's put in the chat, portfolio prioritization is, um, is, a, is a hot topic on most of the courses. So again, where we wanna kind of go into kind of a great level of detail, Holger is quite likely to kind of add on a, a, an extra session for you. Uh, we are having conversations with Holger about how we make those extra sessions available um, to the delegates. So, because they're, they're, they're starting to be more of them now. So it's kind of question about kind of how much detail we want to put in the course and make it a kind of a three or a four day course and before you know it will be there for a fortnight. So the idea is, is that kind of this, uh, this course will allow you to uh, do that kind of assessment and have a look at uh, what's in your organisation uh, moving forward. 
So uh, what I want to do is I want to go back to the governance arrangements and just kind of talk about um, decision making. And again, one of the reasons why we kind of pick these subjects, apart from the fact it's kind of, you know, it's kind of it's one that is of particular interest, but actually it allows us to kind of demonstrate the content of the course in terms of I'm not sure of any other course that kind of deals with these particular issues, but also to demonstrate the fact that we give the kind of the, uh, the impact on portfolio management quite clear, but also some of the theories uh, that we can use to um, be applied back in our organizations. And it's really interesting in terms of where you've got a course, because you know we, we've got kind of the eight different indicators that typically you're gonna have people on the course where people are much more mature in one particular area than the other. So as well as doing the theories that we have in the course materials, there is the opportunity to share some of the other approaches that are used by other organizations. Uh, and based on Holger's experience, they can again give very much kind of practical examples of, of different organizations and, and how they've made the various kind of theories and models work. So just going um, on to um, decision making, um, and I absolutely love this uh, this piece that, that has been written here, is that as human beings, when faced with tough choices, we focus the majority of our attention on making the right choice. We get very concerned about what might happen if we make the wrong choice or we end up in the wrong place after making that decision. And actually, um, what a lot of the um, time and effort perhaps should be doing is not just focusing on the right choice, but actually making choices in the right way. Now, you know, kind of immediately applicable to portfolio management as we're deciding on uh, which projects and programs we may want to um, to address. Again, senior management very much focusing on having the right choices and part of our role within the PMO is making sure that the process we get to um, making those right choices is actually done in the right way, because otherwise we might end up with what appears to be the right choice but because we've not um, got to that process in the correct way then we may not be the optimal choice for our organization so in terms of kind of the standard kind of decision making process and this is a kind of very kind of standard one in terms of kind of going through so we recognize we need to make a choice now i have to say in some organizations when we're talking at portfolio level they don't recognize they need to make a choice they just say yes we'll do it all yes yes we'll find the money we'll find the time as long as there's a good business case uh, and i've worked in an organ I've worked with an organization where they've said if it's got a good business case we'll sign it off because we know our hard working staff we We'll, um, we'll find a way to make it work, which is um, an, an interesting approach. But again, about collecting the data, understanding uh, the criteria for those choices, make sure we develop the options, get buy-in from the stakeholders, make the final choice, implement the decision and adjust as necessary. And, you know, I'd be quite surprised that everybody kind of looks at that and say, well, actually, Ellie, and that makes perfect sense. You know, why would we not go through that process every time we make a decision, which is, you know, absolutely right. But very often in our organizations, there are a number of distortions that make this process. We either kind of miss elements or we don't do things completely um, to make sure we get to that correct choice and recognize there may be some adjust, adjustments um, to, as necessary. So one of the things we're, we're just gonna do is we're just gonna have a look at those kind of four different elements that may distort the decision-making. But I'm gonna ask a question first. I realize I've just been talking forever. How has, um, for those of you who are involved in the portfolio management, um, do you have a decision-making process that you follow? Is it formally logged or is it just a case of, well, actually that makes perfect sense, Eileen. Why would we assume we do anything different to that? I don't think we've got anything codified, but I think we have a version of that. Uh, okay. It, 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 it makes sense to write it down, I think, though, and, uh, and give more clarity to it, because I, I can see how we occasionally may skip stages. Yes. Not intentionally. <laughs> uh, 
No, not intentionally, <laughs> primarily yeah. to run out of time or, or, or whatever, but yes. Uh, okay. But you will find also cases where people intentionally skip stages in order to distort the outcome of the decision-making process. I, you know what the outcome is before you start, okay? So you have that coming into it as well. Yeah, definitely yeah, so in my organisation. <laughs> totally. Yes. Yeah. All that kind of get buy-in of stakeholders. Yes, we get to a point very often if um, we've got... Uh, any kind of quantitative data and this is one of the things that I really object to about uh, benefits management we've kind of got to the point where it's kind of the spreadsheet says this is the answer based on you know kind of the the cost benefit analysis without any real view as to what's gone into doing that cost benefit analysis and we've not got any kind of disbenefits listed or anything so it can be very easy to kind of not have that wider discussion and really understand what's driving the decisions uh, and the solutions or the choices that we're making. I would agree on that as well Eileen from our business that's exactly what happens. Carol, you've tried to um, automate yours with MS Flow. What does and how does automation help or hinder the process? Um, it helps because it sort of like formalizes each step. Uh, hinders obviously when it goes wrong, <laughs> which is great. Um, so I think there's pros and cons to it. It was also quite good for helping us define the process and the steps that we wanted to go through and is that so it was a way to about it in kind of from a portfolio management perspective and is that a decision making process generic across the organization for other things or is that specifically in a portfolio management um situation it's specifically in a for and it's specifically for digital portfolio management so we okay. we're only a sub portfolio Okay. So the other portfolio have got their own way of doing yeah. it as well. And again, linking back to the other uh, the other section where we talk about culture and compliance, um, it's interesting as to whether so compliance and consistency. It's whether this decision making process is seen to be new and original for portfolio management, or we're used to going through this process uh, within a project um, perspective or a program perspective, or where we've got to make other kind of detailed choices. So I'm thinking about you know something like recruitment do we use a similar decision making process so it actually kind of becomes um, second nature in our organization Scott I'm interested in your yes but um, basically yes we do have um, a, a documented and approved prioritization matrix which is um, accordingly weighted however there is the um, and careful not to use the impolite acronym here. Um, get on with it, stuff. A GFDI. That's the one. Yes. Okay. So again, that's that 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 kind of well, yes, we do, but sometimes it's we only pay lip surface to that process. Depends on who you are as to whether you're allowed to bypass it or not. Yes. Do you know the best uh, definition I ever heard was off of office politics was where different people have to do different things to get the same outcome, which yeah. I thought was a great kind of definition of, of, of office politics. So we can already we can already kind of see that, um, can't we? That in terms of uh, and this is where kind of on the course we would create those linkages to kind of the other sections and why the indicators kind of distill from all of the different uh, themes that we we have some discussion. But just a, a couple of things in terms of kind of um, things that might happen um, along the way that kind of might give us a little bit more insight into why um, some of these distortions happen. Now, we often um, talk about um, biases and there are a number of biases that we have and we've just kind of listed um, a few there. Um, some interesting things about recognizing, you know, the, the people who um, are involved in the decision making and an interesting point you've kind of pulled up there um, Nicole in terms of behaviors and um, personalities um, 
and I like your point you also made, I think, which is very much kind of linked to that behaviour is, is that data driven versus data informed decision making in that, you know, one of the things we um, I've always kind of told senior managers, no spreadsheet ever makes a decision. Some senior manager has to make a decision to take notice of the information that's in the spreadsheet or whatever, however that data has been provided and make a conscious choice to use that decision or use that information as the total basis for a decision. And some of these um, distortions in perception may change how we view some of the figures um, that are provided for us or actually um, may have an impact of some of the information that has been provided us. And, and an interesting kind of role from a, from a PMO perspective, um, and this is something uh, we cover off on the benefits course as well, is as a PMO recognizing those biases exist and look at what we need to do through the decision-making process to counteract those biases. Okay, so really interesting in terms of the confirmation bias, where we are always um, looking for something that reaffirms what we already believe, um, you know, and certainly kind of one of the rules of a, of a PMO is to be that um, objective critical friend who questions and challenges and perhaps adds those, those different kind of perspectives that may not necessarily have been um, considered. Uh, the other things in terms of kind of in, in terms of the choices, there are so so one is kind of in the perception of perhaps the data that's been and as Holger's put there, uh, the information can be kind of quite dislead, quite misleading, but our whole kind of um, when we kind of make the decisions um, may also kind of lead us down to um, making the wrong choices, but perhaps with kind of less um, understanding in terms of kind of why that might uh, might be. And I love this last one about is that authority to make decisions is actually sometimes completely separate from the people who actually have all of those inform you know that information um, to make the decisions. Um, and um, I am, um, I just need to be careful. My, my husband's sitting next door, so I'm just going to be careful about how much I share. But they're going through a, he's going through a particular project at the minute where he's been asked to do something. Uh, and a, implicit in that is him making decisions about things. And he's saying, do you know, I don't have the authority to make those decisions. I can make the, I can make, you know, I'm, I, I know and understand what's going on, but actually the decision needs to be done elsewhere. Often we see the converse of that, where we have a senior manager makes a decision without any real understanding about what the implications are of that and and again one of the kind of the roles of the PMO can be actually kind of talking through and and I, again I can link this through to kind of a benefits management piece in terms of at a senior level they say yes we can make a 10 percent I think we should be able to make a 10 percent kind of cut in savings around these particular projects the people on the ground say I don't understand where those savings are going to be coming from Yes, because we're going to have more expensive equipment. Uh, yes, we may be able to lose one or two staff, but actually getting up to that kind of 10% reduction may be far more than we can kind of an anticipate in doing. So this kind of authority separates um, from knowledge. So that's uh, some of the, the things that we talk about in the whole kind of decision making process and how we can uh, avoid that. Um, this is a very kind of a human uh, trait is there are natural kind of behaviors that have an impact, particularly where we're working at speed, we kind of um, ru rush over things because we kind of assume people are kind of uh, are there with us. And we don't give people the time to reflect on the decision in terms of what those implications are. And so back to that old kind of um, adage that says less haste, more speed. And again, having that kind of documented, documented process, recognizing that we do need to go through each step and agreeing as we go into the decision-making process, how much time we need to give to each of those steps in the process. So just kind of recognizing about kind of some of the things that kind of happen almost imperceptively um, around uh, the room. And I know it's, uh, so this is a, I, I always do oversharing on these things. Uh, I often have a conversation with my husband and then at some point I'll say, we agreed it. And John will say, 
no, we discussed it, Aileen. And I said it was agreed. He said, no, we didn't agree anything. We just had a conversation about it. But I'd assumed because you'd smiled or whatever and kind of nodded that, that you were agreeing with what we were going to do. So again, you know, classic example of kind of meta decision making and the assumption that those decisions have been made um, ahead of time when really we've not gone through the kind of the formal process, got that kind of stakeholder engagement and that kind of positive confirmation of the choices um, that we're going to to make. This uh, third bit here is about recognising that sometimes decisions are hard um, and we sometimes know decisions are hard but we don't necessarily take the time to work out what's hard and how to make that decision making easier so it, it's about actually kind of having that kind of real conversation about we're going to find this hard because and then recognizing what impact that might have on the process we get to or the end decision we come. So there will be certain decisions that are absolutely emotive, yes, in the organization. So, you know, we might be going through, you know, a portfolio level, we're deciding on kind of perhaps who's going to be allocated which pieces of work and a classic emotive decision at portfolio level is who's going to be a senior level sponsor for a program that cuts across three directorates of the organization so if we've got Mike, uh, Nicole and Charles all senior directors in the organization the particular program is going to cut all of those three cut across all of those three directorates and I say right Mike please can you be the the as chief exec mike please can you be the program sponsor already we just need to recognize that to get nicole and charles to sign up to that decision and agree to that choice is going to be quite difficult so just recognizing you know kind of which steps in the process are actually going to be difficult to do and start thinking about kind of how can we overcome that and how can we kind of just own that as we go into um decision making and then the final thing is, is to kind of come back and make sure that we actually um, consciously look at how we make our decisions. Um, Stephen Covey talks about keeping a decision diary, about looking at kind of decisions we've made, recognizing the impact they've had, and going back kind of sometimes, you know, it's not just days later, but sometimes it's weeks later or months later and saying, we made that decision was it a good decision and if it wasn't a good decision what made it a bad decision and what could we have done to actually kind of improve that whole kind of decision making process and the end result so this final thing is about this conscious choice by organizations to want to start making better decisions um, as we continue to improve our maturity in the organization So just a couple of things uh, that we then kind of go on and talk about things that kind of influence uh, factors and um, just thinking about the kind of the standard uh, structure of um, where projects and programs sit in the organization the structure of corporate governance, recognizing we've got layers of governance that will impact kind of who makes the decision, uh, the flexibility we've got the you know, kind of how much of that uh, um, governance is is absolutely clear uh, interestingly i work for an organization uh, work with an organization who work on the principle i um anybody can make any decision they can within their remit but your senior manager can override it at any time which is a really kind of interesting culture. So we've got corporate governance, uh, which is kind of the standard rules of the organization. And then we've got the governance of project management. So how do we manage, uh, and you know, this is kind of typically at portfolio level, how do we manage kind of the portfolio of projects and programs? And a classic example of this is who gets to decide on whether we do a project or program. So you could say in corporate governance that um, senior managers, directors have um, can make decisions up to X amount of uh, pounds, but actually does that mean they can choose to do a project? And one of the difficulties certainly we've got as a PMO manager or as a PMO director is that often we're, when we are established Establishing the governance of project management, we may need to recognize that corporate governance may need to be tweaked. Yes, not completely overridden, but maybe tweaked to ensure that corporate governance 
and the governance of project management kind of sits very closely together. Certainly one of the examples uh, we talked about in course delivery earlier this week is that if we've got a, a finance system uh, and a corporate governance system that says all purchase orders need to be signed off by line managers, that really can mess up a project when actually because you want the sponsor to be able to sign off purchase orders that the project manager raises, even if that sponsor is not the line manager. So again, you can see there's kind of areas where we will need to kind of do that tweaking, which will impact decisions that um, are made. And then finally, we've got the kind of the governance of project management in relation to the individual projects that we've got or individual programs we've got and how the governance structure has been set up between the sponsor, the program manager, the business change managers, the team managers. So again, there'll be a different, um, uh, a different organization structure on a project by project basis and who gets to make what decisions might vary kind of slightly. So certainly kind of a, an interesting, that's why kind of this whole decision piece sits there in front of uh, governance. And then the, the session is um, finalized where we go through um, a recommended or a kind of a, a what's the word, a, a well-known kind of model around decision-making. So this is called the decision an analysis and resolution process um, from CMMI. So this is a kind of a formal uh, evaluation process to um, structure how to go through the uh, alternative solutions and determine the recommended uh, solution. So again, it, it's kind of going back to the kind of that first slide where you said this is the decision-making process, but we talked through kind of some of the theories in terms of kind of what that says to try and overcome some of those um, some of those issues. Conscious that that's 50 minutes gone. <laughs> it's amazing how kind of time flies. Does that give you a did that help in terms of kind of giving you a, a, an indication of the types of things that might be covered on the course, the level of detail uh, we might go into around each of those different sections? So obviously, kind of, I could do them all, but then we're running the course. This is really just to kind of give you um, one particular aspect to that. Um, and I think, uh, as, as, as Holger said, one of the really um, important bits of the course is that kind of discussion with the other delegates who are there to kind of broaden that out. Any other final questions or contributions? Anything you want to add to that, Holger? other than how much you love delivering the courses? Um, well, picking up on one of the things, um, as, it, as it happened, we had, for example, two people from the same industry uh, on one of the training courses, and they helped each other. As in that industry, they're non-competitive. So, you know, it, it just a, a true find for both of them to openly discuss the same points uh, which really helped them to develop their own thinking plus the contributions from others outside the industry also uh, helping to address their issues and sometimes even just questions or don't they kind of just help the thinking you know questions from other people on the course and um, think oh we never kind of thought about it from that or or having to kind of justify why you've got things in a particular way in your organization Nicole, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, who would you say that this particular course is aimed at? At what sort of level within either the PMO and or the organisation in general? It has to be somebody who um, either has accountability for uh, portfolio management or can influence how portfolio management is done in the organization so they can kind of also influence how the organization can kind of structure itself in order to do agile portfolio management. So from a PMO perspective, typically that's going to be a PMO manager or a PMO director. Yeah, and that there is, you know, material, for example, from Gardner that um by 2025, your PMO should be helping the strategic uh, investment management uh, within the organization in order to contribute to the value creation of your organization. 
and you you see that when and people talk not about a PMO, but a VMO or a TMO, or the various variants we have coming out like mushrooms, um, it, it, they all have in common to provide an enterprise view or a wider view than we had before, if there was a before. Thank you. So the next uh, portfolio management course is running on the 13th of September. As I said, if you get into, um, you can either kind of go on the website, uh, book yourself on that or phone up and have a conversation with Charles. Um, either of those we're very um, happy with. Um, don't forget, we do have a range of other courses. So I've just kind of listed there on the screen um, some of our up and coming public schedule. Um, any of our courses, including uh, this portfolio management course, um, can be delivered in house. So if you've got kind of six delegates or more, it is more cost effective to, for us to send the trainer to you, whether that be virtually or physically, than actually kind of do multiple places on a, a public course. And there are other advantages of doing in house courses because we can have much more kind of targeted um, conversations. Um, all of the courses, uh, we do provide some further help and support. Uh, I'd like to say it was free, but I get told off for doing that. Um, so we do uh, kind of offer um, some support to organisations where we will help embed um, the theories and the practice in your organisation, or we'll do one-to-one -one coaching um, if you, you as an individual are kind of want to take this forward. So we can kind of either do it as a kind of a consultant to the organisation or um, as a coach to you um, individually. So um, I've put on there the um, our standard offered numbers. You'll see that Hannah has put her email address and contact details in chat. So if you want something specific, um, then do get her. Oh, and Charles has joined in the game. So he's got his direct contact details in there as well. So I hope you found that useful and hopefully we'll hear from you in due course. Or if you need anybody else, this will be available um, on the website so you can point other people um, to this taster session as well. Thank you very much for your time.